I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand up at the last upon the earth, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eye shall behold, and not another. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. On behalf of the Acting Warden and Fellows, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the College this afternoon. We have come here today to remember before God Christopher Watson, sometime Fellow of this College, to give thanks for his life, for his many years of service to this place, and for his love of family, colleagues, and friends. As we recall with deep gratitude the ways in which Christopher enriched our lives, so we commend his soul to God and pray for all who mourn his passing. O Father in heaven, we bless thy name for all who have finished this life in thy faith and fear for the example of their lives and the peace in which they rest. We praise thee today for thy servant Christopher, for we have seen in his friendship reflections of thy compassion, in his integrity demonstrations of thy goodness, in his faithfulness glimpses of thine eternal love. As we honour his memory, meet us in our sadness and fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing the hymn, Lord of all hopefulness.
be seated for the reading. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. <coughs> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <coughs> Dear beloved family and friends and colleagues of Christopher, a huge thank you for coming to this, both a sad but also a joyful event to remember and celebrate together Christopher's long life. You will all have your own vivid memories of him and I hope you will share them with others after the service. Afterwards we'll move to the hall for refreshments and then on to the Savile Room where you'll find a wonderful display of photos of Christopher's many operas provided by Jonathan Suster. And we'll put out pages there for you to write your greetings, memories and farewells to Christopher to go into a folder together for Anne. My own memories of Christopher go back more than 60 years since our undergraduate days. We became good friends and we shared a house together shortly after graduating. It's from that period that I owe him the greatest debt of my whole life. Uh, he introduced me to his younger sister, Virginia, my wonderful wife. I should say it damn near didn't happen since I got to meet her only the very day she was leaving Oxford. I don't know how he kept her hidden from me so long. Christopher crammed several different lives into one, truly a man for all seasons. I can discern at least six main threads that wove all through his life. First, his lifelong devotion to science and to solving practical real-world problems. Second, alongside this, his almost equally passionate love of music and music mating. Third, his profound sense of public service, the pursuit of peace and of saving the world from nuclear catastrophe. Peter Jenkins will tell you more about that side and about Christopher's leading role in the international pugwash movement. Christopher had three equally powerful private passions. Foremost, his lifelong devotion to his wife and family. His affection for Oxford college life in all its peculiar and quirky ways. And his love also of wild, wet, boggy places, principally in Wales and in his native Scotland. I'll tell you something about each of these as we go along. Christopher's love of science began from an early age, setting up a chemistry lab in his parents' back room, making dreadful stinks. For his two years national service, obligatory for every young man in those far off days, he joined the Royal Engineers, the nearest he could get to doing practical science in the army. 
He seems to have thoroughly enjoyed his time, the comradeship and the practical problem solving, both in Germany and briefly in the ill-fated Suez invasion. In Suez, he constructed a Bailey Bridge across the canal and then had immediately to dismantle it. Back in Osnabrück, he recalled crashing a huge and unwieldy ferry carrying an atomic cannon into the river bank, breaking off a big steel chunk, which he later, was later presented to him as a souvenir. There followed four years as an undergraduate scholar at Corpus, three years of chemistry, then a dramatic switch to theoretical physics for his final year. Naturally, Christopher, he got a first. Then straight on to a DPhil in theoretical plasma physics, including a three-year attachment to Harwell. None of this high-powered academic stuff could deflect him from music organising and singing in endless student concerts and at least four major university opera productions. Meanwhile, always original, if not maverick, in his long vacations, Christopher obtained employment as an assistant lighthouse keeper in remote parts of the Western Isles, on Isla, on Skye, on Ailsa Craig and Fidra. By now, he, <clears throat> he already knew his life's calling to realize the dream of controlled nuclear fusion, to provide the world with unlimited clean energy and an end to polluting, climate-destroying fossil fuels. That's what his DPhil thesis was all about. And <clears throat> Three weeks after his thesis viva in December 1964, Christopher was on the train to Moscow in a, on a Royal Society exchange with the Russian Academy of Sciences to further this same scientific dream at the elite Korchatov Institute. It was the height of the Cold War. His room was continuously bugged. He was followed everywhere by the KGB. But amazingly, none of this seemed to bother him. In February, the temperature fell to minus 25 centigrade. But Christopher still insisted on attending formal embassy parties in his Highland kilt. <laughs> his enormous fur coat came to just about the same height above his knees as the kilt, so that, as my friend Geoffrey Hosking described to me, out in the street, he looked like a wild and woolly shepherd whose trousers had fallen down. <laughs> During his year there, he published two major theoretical papers with his Russian colleagues. <laughs> he must have worked his socks off. This didn't prevent him from also traveling around the Soviet Union. He spoke at a big conference in Novosibirsk. Besides, also dancing there with a ballerina, and winning a dance competition for the twist. He visited, visited Kharkov, Kiev, Tbilisi, and sampled the White Knights in Leningrad. In Tbilisi, he recorded, one man, one bottle of wine was the minimum ration. And all through his year in Russia, he kept up a vigorous social life. His Russian address book from that time contains well over 50 names and addresses. He returned to UK just in time to come to our wedding in Edinburgh and the start of a four-year junior research fellowship here at Merton College. So began his lifelong attachment to Merton, where he later became a supernumerary and finally emeritus fellow. He regularly dined in college and he supervised a long string of research students. From Moscow, Christopher had been courting Anne Crace by letter while she was a medical student in London. The following Easter, from his parents' home in Edinburgh, he dragged her up one of the still snow-clad, frozen Pentland peaks, and there on the top proposed to her. Anne accepted her teeth still chattering with cold. 
Christopher's lawyer father assured her that promises extracted under duress were not legally binding. <laughs> but Anne had no doubts. And in December 1966, they were joyfully married right here in Merton College, Myrtle Chapel, <coughs> followed by a honeymoon in Morocco. Their marriage lasted 56 years and was a cornerstone of both their lives. In September the following year, they celebrated the birth of their firstborn, Natasha, and to Christopher's lifelong pride and joy, there followed two other much-loved daughters, Miranda and then Trio. In 1969, together, they bought Pengelfach, a remote and dilapidated Welsh shepherd's cottage high up on the, sh on the slopes of the Sugarloaf, a purchase that provided the family with a, a joyful, if distinctly primitive, holiday home for the next 50 years. Meanwhile, Christopher's stellar career continued. In 1968, following his three-year JRF at Merton, he began working at the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy on the theoretical design for a nuclear fusion reactor. Ten years later, Cullum was chosen as the host site for the Joint European Taurus, the JET project, to build just such a reactor. And in January 1979, he transferred to the JET project as project controller, working closely <clears throat> with Hans Otto Wister, his its brilliant and charismatic director. Christopher thought the world of him. JET was an immensely ambitious program aimed at opening the way to supplying the world with unlimited clean energy eliminating the need for climate destabilizing fossil fuels. Something like bottling a tiny fragment of the sun. Christopher was in on the project from its inception. By 1983, JET achieved its first plasma. The initial aim was to achieve scientific break-even when the energy produced equals the energy put in. Sadly, neither JET nor its American competitor ever got there, though JET came closer than any other machine, a record it held until 220, 2021. In total, Christopher spent 17 years at Cullum. It was the most fulfilling period of his professional career and, I believe, the happiest time of his life. Throughout all these years, on top of a colossal workload for his day job, Christopher continued his voluntary work as a trained counsellor for the then so-called Marriage Guidance Council, nowadays called RELATE, and for Pugwash. You'll hear more about that shortly. After Hans Otto's sudden and unexpected death in 1985, Christopher transferred to the Atomic Energy Authority at Harwell. First, a surprising move as research manager for offshore technology, working on the ability of North Sea oil rigs to withstand the worst possible wave impacts. And then, back to the nuclear industry in nuclear robotics. Robotics led on to his work for AEA technology in Russia. Christopher made a huge commitment to the, this project, working with Russian colleagues, seeking safe ways to dismantle nuclear-powered submarines. The task was, and I quote, safely cutting up 40,000 tonnes of metal, 50 metres long, into three chunks, the two ends to be recycled, and the central nuclear section to be put into long-term storage. One wonders where. The Russians had been using hot oxyacetylene cutters, a distinctly hazardous procedure, and Christopher helped them to develop a new technology using very high-pressure water jets, which, he proclaimed, could slice through the hull like butter. 
After Christopher's retirement in 2002, his frequent trips to Russia continued under the UK-Russian Closed Nuclear Cities Partnership, seeking new peaceful employment for future nuclear weapons scientists. All through his hugely energetic and varied career, Christopher kept up his deep love of music. He organized and took leading roles in ever more ambitious opera performances with a superb cast of singers, including Gold, Claire, Kipper, and many other stars. They were performed, mostly with minimal rehearsal, score in, vocal score in hand, variously in Merton College and Hollywell Music Room. I counted, I think, a total of 22 such operas. The gorgeous costumes were provided by Kipper Chipperfield. Production was by Georgina Ferry, lighting by David Long. They were truly a tour de force. Don't miss the photo exhibition in the Savile Room. Christopher's madrigal group, the Anonymous Singers, Anonymous Singers, likewise continued to meet and sing together regularly, never missing their annual champagne picnic on the Charwell, singing from their punts to the cows on the riverbank. In later life, Christopher took up the cello, together with Anne on the viola, playing in a string quartet and in the studio orchestra, always with huge enjoyment, even if he played only some of the notes in the fast bits. In 2002, Sholto Kinoch provide, founded the Oxford Leader Festival, and from 2004, Christopher was the chair of its newly created charitable trust, sorting out its initially precarious finances. Christopher, <coughs> sorry, Christopher's longing for a peaceful world led to his long attachment to Oxford Quaker Meeting, of which he was a faithful member and attender for nearly half a century. In the Sunday morning meetings, he frequently gave spoken ministry, most often about some challenging aspect of world affairs. His deep commitment to peace and disarmament between the nuclear-armed East and West found vigorous lifelong expression also in the international pugwash movement. And Peter Jenkins will tell you more about this very important aspect of his life. Christopher was a most remarkable man. A man of immense and varied talents with a lifelong commitment to public service as well as to his immediate family and friends and colleagues. I loved him. I deeply miss him. And he's always good humoured and engaging company. May he rest in peace. And what unites us is that each one of us has played with Christopher and Anne's wonderful convivial Thursday quartet evening, or in the case of Jeremy, in the studio orchestra. We've met over many years and so much enjoyed the string quartet repertoire with Christopher and Anne. At the last meeting in which Christopher was well, 
Christopher said he had been through 10, all 10, of Mozart's most famous Berumpter string quartets, and he had graded all the string quartets, and he had selected those that were top of the chart, and he gave me the music to prepare for his top favorite quartet, which is Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, which is what we would like to play for you today and I'm playing from the very score that he handed me and said, look at this one, let's prepare and play this one at our next meeting. And this is the next meeting. Thank you so much to Christopher and Anne for those joyous evenings we've spent with you. And um, the quartet has convened together, especially for this occasion to play that chosen quartet of, of, of Christopher's, the Dissonance Quartet. We're playing the slow movement.
Bugwash, to which you have already heard several references, has its roots in a document known as the Russell Einstein Manifesto. In 1955, Lord Russell, Albert Einstein, and nine other scientists, including Max Born, put their names to a statement deploring the threat to the survival of mankind, which the addiction of our species to war posed, and also deploring the advent of atomic and particularly thermonuclear weapons. They called for a conference to, quote, appraise the perils that have arisen as a result of the development of weapons of mass destruction, unquote, and they adopted a resolution that reads, quote, in view of the fact that in any future world war, nuclear weapons will certainly be employed and that such weapons threaten the continued existence of mankind, we urge the governments of the world to realize and to acknowledge publicly that their purpose cannot be furthered by world war. And we urge them consequently to find peaceful means for the settlement of all matters of dispute between them. This manifesto led to 20 scientists meeting at the invitation of a US-Canadian philanthropist in Pugwash, Nova Scotia in July 1957 and founding the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs to give the movement its formal name. Christopher joined Pugwash in 1969 when he was 32 and a principal scientific officer at the Cullum Laboratory of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. What impelled him to join is unclear, to me at least. One possibility is that the is that national service in an artillery unit in Germany in the mid-1950s contributed to his motivation. He spoke to me once with a mix of humour and horror of his unit being supplied with nuclear shells for use in the event of a Warsaw Pact invasion of Germany. Equally possible, if not more so, is that he had read and been inspired by the Russell Einstein Manifesto and by the concluding statement of that founding meeting of physicists and chemists in Nova Scotia in 1957, of which the peroration reads, the conclusion of our discussion on the responsibilities of scientists states our common conviction that we should do all in our power to prevent war and to assist in establishing a permanent and universal peace. This we can do by contributing to the task of public enlightenment concerning the great dilemma of our times and by serving to the full extent of our opportunities in the formation of national policies. The pugwash that Christopher joined matched words with deeds. It convened more than 200 meetings of natural and political scientists during the Cold War. And it is credited with having contributed to the banning of nuclear 
tests, to the drafting of a nuclear non-proliferation treaty that has withstood the test of time, and to US-Russian nuclear arms reduction agreements, as well as to the biological and chemical weapon conventions which ban and have largely eliminated those weapons. In 1995, its leading light, Professor Joseph Rotblatt, a signatory of the Russell Einstein Mani Manifesto and Pugwash itself were awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. Christopher's passing has left a gaping hole at the heart of the British branch of Pugwash. His intellectual contribution to our work and the energy and commitment that he brought to the course work to the cause were immense. These contributions have been especially apparent in the period since 2002 when Christopher joined uh, the British Branches Executive Committee, becoming its chairman in 2011. During this period, he studied and made recommendations for the safe and secure management of the UK's large stock of plutonium. He led a peer review commissioned by the Ministry of Defence of research into the verification of nuclear disarmament, research underway at the UK's atomic weapons establishment. In an age of concern about global warming, he extended British Pugwash's range of interests to include energy policy. And he co-produced reports comparing the likely impact on the climate of potential energy pathways, that is to say, potential forms of energy production. Above all, as chairman of British Pugwash, he devoted himself to the ambitious idea of a British International Nuclear Disarmament Institute, BRINDI. The establishment of such an institute had been proposed by a new Labour government. They had had in mind a laboratory that would capitalise on the UK's technical expertise in developing protocols for verifying nuclear disarmament. Christopher sought to widen the scope to include work sorry, I lost my place, to include work on political aspects of moving to a world free of nuclear weapons. Alas, after much hard work, it became apparent that the goal could not be realised without an admixture of government funding, and this seemed unlikely in an age of austerity under a Conservative government. During all this period, Christopher was the best of colleagues. <coughs> kind, generous, good-humoured, considerate and reliable are among the adjectives, among the adjectives that uh, his British Pugwash committee colleagues have used to describe their perceptions of him. As if his con contributions to British Pugwash were not enough, for more than a de decade, Christopher sat on the Council of International Pugwash. In that circle, he was highly respected for his knowledge and for the power of his intellect, but also much liked. Th 
the constructive and friendly spirit that I witnessed at a meeting of European Pugwash groups in 2019, which Christopher organized and chaired, was testimony to that. One of his colleagues on that International Council has written, quote, Christopher was a very constructive scientist who advanced Pugwash goals in significant ways. I admired his British fairness, his loyalty, and his human touch. He always radiated optimism and an interest in all things. There is a proverb in the Islamic tradition according to which when a true scholar dies, a hole appears in the great wall of knowledge, a hole that cannot be filled. I hope I can be forgiven, standing as I am in a Christian place of worship, for suggesting that this Islamic notion is apposite at a celebration of the life of a man who was a true scholar and a true gentleman.
Let us pray. Receive, O Lord, in tranquility and peace the soul of thy servant Christopher, who out of this present life has departed to be with thee. Grant him rest. Let light perpetual shine upon him and place him in the habitations of life, the abodes of blessed spirits, and give him the life that knoweth not age, the good things that pass not away. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we pray for those who mourn Christopher's passing, let us remember in particular Anne and all the members of their family. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comforts, deal graciously, we pray with thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we celebrate Christopher's great gift for friendship, let us pray for all with whom we share our lives and give thanks that the bonds of friendship forged on earth are not broken by death. O God, thou art the author of all true and tender affections. We thank thee for the friends thou hast given us. We implore thee to bring them home to thee in the celestial palaces of light and joy. May we live with the sure expectation of a joyous welcome from them when thou shalt call us to thyself. Take our friendships into thy keeping and grant that they may endure in life everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And finally, let us pray for ourselves that we may live in the light of eternity. Bring us, O Lord, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven to enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling but one equal light, no noise nor silence but one equal music, no fears nor hopes but one equal possession. No ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity in the habitations of thy glory and dominion, world without end. In silence, let us hold in our hearts our fondest memories of Christopher, giving thanks to God for all that he has meant and will continue to mean to each of us. We join all these prayers together in the words our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We stand to sing the final hymn.
The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. In memoria eterna erit justus. Justorum anime in manu dei sunt. Domine Deus resurrectio et vita credentium, qui semper es laudandus, tamen viventibus quam indefunctis. Agimus tibi gratias, profundatore nostro Walter O. de Merton, ceterisque benefactoribus nostris, Corum beneficiis hic ad pietatem et studia literarum alimo. Rogantes, but no sistonis satuam gloriam recte utentes, una cum illis ad resurrectionis gloriam immortalem peducamo. Pe Christum, Dominum Nostrum. <laughs> 